background, I am Nira. I'm one of the founders of Vesra, and I'm not going to speak anything about Vesra today, but very quickly tell you that um, we've been around for 16 years, and all of these organizations and individuals have been part of the ecosystem that we've been trying to build in the country, all around trying to help organizations achieve the scale and impact that they want to have. So all the organizations you see here all have very different approaches, but all are trying to be enablers and trying to really catalyze change. And the question, the opening question that I'd like sort of each of you to please focus on is a little bit around, highlight what it is that the work that you do, uh, what is the environment that you're trying to enable, and the challenges that are there that you're trying to sort of overcome. So it gives a quick snapshot each of your perspectives. Uh, and why don't we uh, start with Zinia? I'm from an organization called XPRIZE. <laughs> Some of you may have heard it because you heard Anusha speak earlier about the first prize that she funded, uh, which was in suborbital space. And at XPRIZE, we are an innovation catalyst. If you look at it, I'll break it down, take out all the fancy words. We're basically a technology incubator. We incubate large-scale, very futuristic technologies for the benefit of humanity. So we work in multiple sectors. We work in energy and environment. We work in exploration, which is space and oceans. All of our oceans work is now tied to climate change. And we work in development. We work in water. We work in the future of food. So basically what we do is, we look at the future state of the world. We say, huh, by 2050, we have to feed 9.3 billion people on our planet. And we don't just have to feed them. We know how to feed them with genetically engineered wheat and corn. We know that. And the Gates Foundation has done all kinds of great work on mapping land and figuring out how much uh, available agricultural land there would be by then, etc. But how are we going to nourish these people? How are they going to get the real amino acids and nourishment from them? So we look at the future and we say, why are we waiting till 2050 to figure this out? By 2025, two out of every three people are going to live in water scarce areas. Why are we waiting another nine years to figure this out? So we want to figure out these problems now. So we want to accelerate the future. We for us, our entry point is technology. We believe science and technology are great enablers for massive change. But we all know, I come from a hardcore development background, 20 years, 25 countries, uh, multiple issues, uh, six social enterprises. We all know that technology doesn't end poverty, doesn't educate kids, doesn't cure the sick. There are all kinds of systems we've got to wrap and services we have to wrap around it and awareness, education around this technology to truly make a difference. So in XPRIZE, one of our big criticisms was just that, that we were doing some really good, cool work. But the cool stuff that came out just kind of sat on a shelf somewhere. And I was brought into XPRIZE to take XPRIZE to scale and to address the issue of development issues today, the issues of humanity today with futuristic technology and wrap around the kind of services and other modalities needed for that to actually be adopted across the world. One of the biggest and most difficult things we do is finding innovators. We believe in complete democratization of innovation. We don't care who you are. You don't have to be a, a non-profit, a for-profit, or this or that. You can be a crazy person off the street. You can be a multi-billionaire with an idea. We don't care. If you can build it and it can operate in real life, in real time, you can win the prize. So that's basically what we do. But now we've just come to India. And when you start saying, we're looking for innovators everywhere. I want to find innovators in India. It's not that easy. My challenge is, how do you level the playing field so that 
some innovators from, let's say even, let's not even go as far as a village, okay? Let's just say from a tier three city, a small engineering college somewhere. How can that team compete with a team from GE? How can that team compete with a team from MIT? So leveling the playing field is a big challenge that when, when, when we come to a place like India, when we are in Brazil, when we're in other countries, that is a big challenge that I'm facing. And I'd love to hear feedback, maybe even after the session, about how I can really trickle out to innovators everywhere. So we've come to India about two years ago, but it took me two years to get my government registration. We just got everything sorted out last week. Meanwhile, we have designed, yeah, it took two years. <laughs> for a signature, but uh, meanwhile, we have designed two prizes, two very exciting prizes, one in the future of water, and one in women's safety. The prize is that, I'm not gonna tell you exactly what they are, but especially the women's safety prize is not just a device. Yes, there is technology, because that is our expertise, that is our anchor, so there's a technology component, and then there's a huge social component to it as well to make sure the technology actually works. Because again, we all know the breakdown is in the response. So how do we build networks of non-traditional responders? So anyway, I'll be rolling those two prizes out in the next couple of months. Uh, please stay tuned and please tell the people you work with, yourselves as well, if you'd like to apply. They're both going to be about a six CR, one million dollar kind of price first. There'll be some other seed funding as well associated with it. And uh, we're really looking for innovations and innovators across India. I just want to add that this prize is not for India. This prize is from India. All our prizes are very, very global. They're open to innovators absolutely everywhere. But you know, you need a test bed, right? You need, if you, a prize is like a, comp it's a competition, right? It's like a race. You need to set up a race course. And India provides a wonderful ground for this race course, because on one hand, yes, we have all the problems here. But on the other hand, we have an amazing ecosystem of entrepreneurship and innovation that is really, really accelerating. It's a great time to be an entrepreneur in India. And a prize, I'll leave you with this, is just an excuse to play in the entire innovation ecosystem. It's really a, a just, just you know, an excuse to kind of catalyze innovation at all levels. So that's who I am and that's why I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'll just, you know, uh, you know, a lot of the people here have big brands and for me it's about making a brand so I'll just talk about uh, what we do. Uh, so at NextGen uh, we started as a startup out of college out of Iron Bangalore uh, uh, about four years back. Uh, we are a technology player in the development sector so you know uh, you have all the startups which you know help you get a cab or you know get food to your house. Uh, we are a startup which uses technology to channelize money better. Uh, for actual impact on the ground. Uh, in the last two years, we launched a platform and uh, we currently work with about 180 companies, uh, channelizing about 1,000 crores of CSR capital annually uh, to more than 1,200 NGOs across the country uh, towards different sectors, different states. Uh, in terms of scale and size, uh, you know, what we have done in two years' time is, you know, uh, Purely because of use of technology is something which uh, I think at a global level also uh, not many people have done that. And uh, what we are seeing today is our technology actually being used not just in India but across the world. Uh, we work, uh, you know, we have clients like a Microsoft or an Amazon or a Google who uses our technology to understand the impact of their development sector projects on the ground. And uh, X number of people, X you know, number of NGOs, X number, uh, and that's that's something which pains us. And what we are trying to build is something which is, you know, really scalable, scalable, wherein we make in India, but for the world, and you know, make a 
you know, the fashion nowadays is to create a unicorn, a billion dollar company. And uh, we are fairly confident that, you know, we would become a billion dollar company helping a billion people as well. So that's, that's our next thing and I would love to hear more. Uh, we've been working on a number of uh, projects in a number of areas, we're now in five states. And I thought that just to make the conversation a little simple, I thought I'd give you one example of, uh, of something we do, uh, and that may be a way for you to um, understand better what our model is and our method of working. So if I take one example, um, I'm going to take an example of a, a girl called Sona, who's been in our program since she was about 12. And uh, she lives in uh, Bandra East slums of Mumbai. She is a part of a family of five, one of three siblings, her parents, her father was out of work when she came into our program, her mother was a domestic help, temporary work uh, in the high rising around the slum. And uh, this girl was at that time in the seventh standard, coming to the eighth grade. That's when we started our program there. We were doing a tobacco control program in school. Which we were Listening to Dr. Bang this morning, you would understand that tobacco is a huge problem in India. Unfortunately, it's not created into uh, enough into a priority for our country. It's become a little bit of a political tamasha, but it's a serious health concern. So just to give you a little insight, in India, of all the tobacco users that exist in the country, and there are we are the second highest in the world for tobacco consumption, one in every three is somebody who started before the age of 10. So what I would like to say is for us, Tobacco is not an adult problem. It's a pediatric problem. It's a children's problem. So we started this program with the idea that we're going to intervene at a point when a child is still contemplating to use tobacco. And we realized that that's very often at the age of 10, 11, and 12. That's when we started working in the school. We created a, uh, a school-based model called Supernami. And that's when Sonam came into the program. So this, she's in this program, and she's interacting with the team. She's in the classroom. Somebody who was a reticent, quiet girl, not uncommon to find girls at that age. You know, Pastor has done so much work on the adolescent girls, and we'll, you, 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 you hear from their report that that's the age when girls are most likely to drop out of school. That's the age when you lose them within the system completely. So, have them withdrawn and not participated is not, it's, it's very common. So that's when we had her in the program. Uh, one one day, it's, it's such happened, it so happened that uh, her, her uh, a group who was working on tobacco control did a play in their community in the slum, which was an anti-tobacco play. And that's part of our model is about not only you know teaching young people about the issues around tobacco use, but also encouraging them to go and participate within the community to spread that message. So there is this whole concept of building self-efficacy, but also responsibility. Not only that I can understand and empower myself to change, but I have the ability to change people around me. So she was in this community doing this play, and her father, who was out of work, came to see her do the play. That evening, he had a conversation with her mother, and they had been contemplating asking her to drop out of school because there was financial pressure. Her mother was the only working member in the family, only for the family of five. Mother's monthly income was sub 5,000 rupees at that point. She said, you know, this girl drops out of school, then she can start you know, getting at least a few hundred rupees in, and that will help the family. But the father had seen her, he was so proud. He said, you know, I think you should give her a few more months at school. And that gave Sonam a few more months. So she continued at school. She reaches class 9. And she comes into um, our skill building program. We call it Project Resume, which has actually got a choice of picking any one of 10 skills to provide at school. The whole range of skills. She wanted to do duration and hair care. So she picked up that course. And it's, the, the courses range between 60 to 120 hours. They're done within school, with school children picked up that program, completed the course, and then um, there was another opportunity in the community, but there was another play. Again, an anti-tobacco play, and these kids all dressed up and went. She wasn't in the play this time. This time she was backstage because she was doing the hair and the makeup of all the children who were in the play. She actually went to her parents that evening and spoke to them and told them that she had an opportunity to do an internship on weekends at a local salon. She would get in a stipend and she would get to keep the tips. So her parents were in need of money. They said, okay, let's see how this goes. We started working at that salon and started bringing anything between 1,000 to 2,000 rupees home on the weekend. What that allowed is that Sonam is still in school. She's now in the 10th standard of hearing for an SEC exam. She wants to complete school. She wants to study further because someday she wants to open her own salon. Now, if I tell you that the whole story is linked of tobacco control, staying in school, and building skills, it will not make any sense. But I'm hoping that my little story told you how we can do it. That's what's done.
We like to change the way the world tackles poverty. Um, Ackerman started about 15 years ago, and the, the philosophy um, was that uh, there was a huge amount of value that uh, grant capital was providing in terms of, uh, you know, providing uh, base level uh, input to many, many, many people around the world. And then there was um, commercial capital, which ran commercial organizations. At that time, the ability to actually uh, support an organization like uh, what we just heard about, NextGen, um, really didn't exist as an ecosystem in the world, far be it from, uh, far be it from uh, in India. Um, so Acumen started with the philosophy that we would like to consider changing the idea of our a person being a a, do, a donee or a, or a, a someone who's a, chari a charitable someone who we have to do charity for, but actually ch change that philosophy and turn it into being someone who's your customer and as a result giving them choice. And that's the basic philosophy of Acumen as an investing organization. I think the best way to explain what Someone like Acumen has done, uh, you know, is that uh, I'll just give you three examples of uh, companies that we have invested in in India. Um, a company like LaborNet, which uh, which started about five years ago, it was started by a lady called Gayatri, uh, and Gayatri has spent spent many years in a very cushy job in the. In the and I don't know if any of you guys have heard about LaborNet, but. Uh, uh, Labor Net, she started, uh, she had a very comfortable job in the United Nations, uh, you know, doing extremely well, but just felt that, what, you know, all the work that she had been doing was not actually helping um, uh, the fundamental issue of dealing with uh, unskilled laborers in our country, and unskilled workers in our country. So she started Labor Net, and uh, flash to today, she trains about 100,000 plus people, uh, you know, workers each year in India. Um, 70 to 80 percent of them are migrant workers who basically build our lovely, lovely, uh, you know, buildings and our lovely uh, houses, but they themselves are, you know, um, barely subsisting. Um, and her idea was that you can actually train them to improve the quality of the way in which they uh, wire pull and bar bend, and then actual programs that she created on the ground, on site. Um, for them to learn while also educating them. And um, along with that, uh, you immediately also teach them safety because the level of safety standards is extremely low. Um, so 80% you know, of that number is that. So that's an example of a company which uh, we invested in as, a, as an investor. So we are actually on the board of the company and we, we help the com company in terms of actually driving uh, their growth, investing in them and driving you know, for us the, great, the success of that organization is, is that they can keep moving and, and training more and more people and actually uh, the success that we saw finally when we measured the impact of that was 75% of the migrant laborers actually got uh, better paying jobs in the next, uh, in the next, uh, you know, in their next, uh, uh, after, after having done one of, one of our pieces of work. So that's one example. Um, Another area of our, for us of great importance is energy. And again, I'll flash back many years ago now to a company called D-Light. Again, I don't know if many of you have heard of a company called D-Light. Uh, D-Light is an example of something that Genia talked about in terms of something quite fundamental, using technology to sort of disrupt the way in which people thought about it. It was set up by uh, two Stanford MBA grads called Ned and Sam. Uh, and uh, their idea actually was very simple. They, they saw um, you know, the situation of the Indian woman uh, using uh, you know, either a chula or using kerosene and the fumes that came from that and said, you know what, if we can create a solar lantern for the house so that, uh, you know, they can at least, uh, you, know, uh, you know, to that extent they will reduce the amount of fumes in the house because you know, that would be a great start uh, because they don't have to have one more additional kerosene lamp in addition to the chula. Um, they, that's actually all that they wanted to do and they said, you know, we are Stanford MBAs, we'll get jobs if this thing doesn't work out. Um, you know, it's 2015-16 uh, now and they've sold about 150 solar, uh, million solar lanterns and probably are almost like the Xerox of, consider the Xerox of solar lanterns. Uh, we are proud to have uh, participated with them over multiple rounds of investments over the last 10 years and uh, there's a famous uh, photograph of uh, um, Sam being handing over a solar lantern to President Obama 
uh, or three months ago when he visited him in Africa. Uh, another example of where India has actually helped innovate globally is that while all of this was uh, set out in India, actually about 50% of, uh, of uh, D-Light sales now come in Africa. So it's actually another example of uh, where a small start can go on. And the third piece uh, is, is, is coming back to South, Southern India is actually healthcare, a very important area for us. We, we invested in a maternal healthcare company with the government. And just to, I'm just bringing that idea, I think we've talked. There's been a little bit of government bashing that's happened over the last, uh, you know, uh, and happened. I think we all do it. I just want to put uh, on uh, on record that we, we created a joint venture with a government company called HRL. And um, the we, we created a, uh, a maternal hospital company which basically uh, called LifeSpring. And um, we started in 2008. We probably, at that time, in that particular region of Telangana, uh, just to give you a rough idea, uh, the people whom uh, they were targeting had never been to uh, a hospital, a far beat a hospital had never used midwives and that was you know, the extent of uh, what they were, they were used to. Um, again, 2016 now, uh, that particular region of Telangana, they have 15 hospitals, 7,000 deliveries, affordability, quality and accessibility all in one. And the, and the great news is that when you look at quality, um, what use in what use situation? And, and I remember this even from my days in, in healthcare before joining Acumen, where I would see, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the index of you know of maternal health is not uh, at the time of delivery, but it's actually postnatal in terms of the number of visits. And the number of visits used to be one used to be one visit uh, for one visit. Today, the average number of times that a mother comes for post visits is 9.5 9 is the last number we had. So those are just examples where, and these are companies, they're sustainable, they are making money, uh, but they're also, their primary focus is to deliver social value as well as economic value. And that's what, and, and Acumen, uh, Acumen is just proud to be able to support entrepreneurs who have this kind of passion and vision. 2001, anybody wants to put their hand up? Earthquake. Earthquake. Right. So, so on that day, President Clinton had handed over power to President Bush. Five days after he had handed over power is when this earthquake happened. And he was obviously, after eight years of service to the uh, nation, he was wondering what to do. He heard about this earthquake, made a quick phone call to one of his good friends who was sitting in Delhi, who was running India, Prime Minister Vajpayee. And the conversation, it was a two-minute conversation, which ended with a quick question, can I do anything for you? And Prime Minister Vajpayee, a uh, wise person that he is, turned it around back to him saying, why don't you collect, collectivize all the successful Indians in USA and ask them what they would like to do for their country? That's exactly what President Clinton did uh, for the next uh, six months. Uh, there were series of meetings. All the successful Indians you can think of from Silicon Valley, from the East Coast, from the Midwest, from everywhere they got together. And uh, in February of 2001, they quickly decided to raise money. They raised four and a half million dollars in a matter of a couple of months. And President Clinton actually came down to India, to Gujarat, to start off the relief work that had to happen. Long story short, he came back to uh, US and the group of people registered themselves as Ameri American India Foundation. So that's uh, who we are. Uh, Emil, uh, who's my colleague, Emil and I uh, are representing uh, American India Foundation. It's an, it's an NGO, it's a 501c3, as we call it back in the US. Um, so we are a diaspora platform. It started off as a diaspora platform. It's now a platform which belongs to the community for any like-minded person. And the purpose of this institution is to disrupt poverty in India. That's it. No long sounding buzzwords uh, uh, just to disrupt poverty in India. Of course you have to drill down into how do you do it. Uh, with the help of experts, there are lots of poverty experts. Once you, once you tell them that you are an institution born from the idea of Prime Minister Vajpayee and President Clinton, all the doors opened for us and we had access to good people who were experts who helped us design poverty disrupting programs. So we decided that we will be in three verticals. The first vertical is education, 
Second is livelihoods or skill building. Third is public health. So those are the three focused areas uh, that we have been journeying the last 15 years. And under these three verticals, we have six programs. There are two programs under education, uh, education vertical, two programs under uh, livelihoods vertical, one program under public health, and one leadership program which is called AIF's Clinton Fellowship of Service to India. Those are the six programs we do. Uh, this is the day. This is the day of big data. So let me throw some numbers uh, just to tell you the size of the work that has been happening with the help of all the people who are part of the ecosystem we call as AIF. Uh, we have so far raised and invested more than hundred million dollars uh, in India. We work in 23 of the 29 states. We work with 248 uh, different partners, and one such partner is Dr. Habib Bang. Uh, we're very happy to have you here, sir. Uh, he's our partner. He's the person who's given, who gave us the idea of what to do in terms of our Mansi program. Mansi program focuses on reducing infant mortality rate and maternal mortality rate. A huge success. We'll talk about the details of that later. Um, so, $100 million, 23 states, 248 uh, uh, partners. And the last number, which is the most important number that we, uh, we think we exist for, is the number of people whose lives we've been able to touch and we believe we've been able to transform. That's on last count is 2.5 million people. Um, we, we have, we'll have the new numbers coming up uh, once the March is over and I think it'll probably be 2.75 or 2.8 million of people who are in the base of the pyramid. Now, second question, who wants to say who's, how many number of people who are in the base of the pyramid in India? Take a guess. Sorry? 30. Three zero? Yeah. And that's, that's a reasonable number. According to the government of India, 36 rupees and below. There are a couple of ways you can define ultra poor, ultra poor people. 36 rupees and below is one mark, which is the Planning Commission's number. 348 million people. So that's the, that's the focal area as far as we are concerned. So compare that with 2.5, we are nobody. We haven't done anything yet. So that's what I try to tell our team, saying that at one level it looks like we have done something big, but put it in the context of the number of people who need help today, not tomorrow, not in 10 years' time. I'm sure the help will reach them over a long period of time. So our goal is to reach a number of 5 million. Number is per se not important, it's just a direction, just the context that the work that we do needs to be done urgently. So we believe in a couple of things. We think uh, we, we, we want to test what we are doing. We want to look at issues which are huge, which affect millions of people. We also want to enter a, enter a space where there are, it's not crowded. If 100 people are already doing something, we don't want to enter there. Because so many areas related to poverty, which needs to be attended to, why not are not being attended to. So every one of our programs will have that theme that we want to be unique, we want to focus on coming with a hypothesis to solve the problem, highlight what we are doing with a strong advocacy advocacy uh, focus. We ensure that whatever we do, the local authorities know about it, the local governments know about it, the local, the, the central government knows about it, and all the Indian diaspora people in the support system, they know about it. We keep updating it. Once we know, based on data, that our work is really solid, we try to scale it. So one of, the, one of the programs which we decided to scale recently is what uh, is Mansi program. That was something which we did along with Dr. Rabe Bang and Tata Steel and Jharkhand government. It's a typical VPP model. After four and a half years of data collection, uh, we have come to a place where we are certain that it is wonderful. We're scaling it more than 10 times, entering into new states of Odisha, into new states of uh, Andhra Pradesh and Uttarakhand. So let me stop right here. Um, we will probably have, uh, I can add a little bit more when, when we are in the Q&A session. Thank you. ...that I gave you, so thank you very much in sticking to that. But I'm going to ask you a more open question as it relates to, to the dialogues here, and it's a little bit to do with the title, Execute Locally and Innovate Globally. And we had a bit of a discussion on, on some of the opening panels that maybe it should be Innovate Locally, <coughs> execute globally and if you listen to you know your organizations and the kind of work that you're doing 
I do feel that the latter might actually be the way that we're going. And I'd be interested to hear what each of you think in regards to this and how your organizations are using the local context but yet really need kind of what else is, is out there. So anyone that's ready to... Here, executing globally is important. Uh, for us, we have decided as an institution that we would, we would be focused on disrupting poverty in India. So execution locally is really important. We have a large team. We have eight different offices uh, in uh, in India. We have got starting from Chandigarh to Delhi to Bhubaneswar to Hyderabad, Bangalore, Bangalore, Chennai, and I'm missing and Ahmedabad. So we have we have execution capacity right across the ground. And I think I think uh, we all should be open to ideas, uh, irrespective of whether the ideas or innovation uh, comes from local or from. Uh, overseas, it doesn't really matter. As long as the idea you think is appealing, idea you think is going to be relevant to the community that you're going to serve, uh, one should use it. And I, since, since I believe that it is good to uh, go on a hypothesis, test something before you scale, it's it's fine. It's fine to uh, take the idea, put it to test. Um, if it is great, then you're then 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 you're uh, succeeding. If it, you're, if it is not working out, then you're learning. Either one of these outcomes, this is something which I, somebody taught me, try anything with sincere heart, there are only two outcomes. Uh, you either succeed or you learn. Both are great outcomes. Yeah, tell, tell me a little bit more um, accused in India of being extremely insular, and we sometimes sort of disregard what might come from elsewhere. Although if you see some of the impact investing, a lot of the ideas seem to be all out in Stanford and then automatically they're all going to be kind of scaled here. So there is this tendency for us to be insular, yet some of the innovation is happening outside. There's innovation happening here, but we're not always willing to go to other countries and talk about the kinds of work and best practices here. But Abhishek, do you agree with kind of what? what Perspective, one thing is we have a mobile app which helps you, you know, collect data, make sense of the data and stuff. Uh, you know, World Bank wanted something of this sort, and there were two firms which were working with them. So one was us, one was the company in the US. Uh, so the first requirement was that the mobile app needs to work offline. Uh, and you know, the company in the US asked what is offline. There's internet everywhere. The next question which you know comes in is, uh, does it work with the 2000 rupee phone? Uh, and similarly, the US company would say, is there a 2000 rupee phone? Uh, the next thing is, does it work in you know, 20 different languages? So are there 20 different languages? So I think if you you know start looking at uh, the sector that we operate in, I think uh, in India we have both the problem and solution next door, uh, and it's very easy for us to visualize in real time as to what's happening. But uh, I would say you know we always think other countries as mainly in the US or you know those kind of countries, but I think there are a lot of other countries which we miss out in terms of the other emerging economies where a lot of innovation is happening. And I think the next phase of uh, innovation and evolution, uh, probably in the next couple of years, would happen from these countries. Because the need is there, the people understand the need, and when they want to cross over that need, they would innovate something. So I think the need is in these areas. Um, you know, you spent $10 million to get yourself out into space. Could you have spent your money uh, better? And if you think about it, um, Anusha answered you know, from her own perspective, but that $10 million would have gone very far with, for example, the space program uh, in India. And our cost structures here are often extremely low. So having that sort of innovation, making the buck go a bit further here, would lead me to say, you know, maybe it should definitely be sort of innovate locally for sure, execute maybe even locally as well. But it'd be interesting to hear, because I know it. This I'm just talking about the Express platform. Uh, we innovate and execute globally. And we believe that innovation can come from anywhere because we are an inno open innovation platform. And I, I'd like to take a chan uh, chance at answering the question as to show in a bit too. So, um, but, but we both innovate and execute globally. How? How does that happen? Because we all know context is everything. If you're not contextual, you're, you're out of date, you're out of business, right? I'll give you the example of a prize that we just finished testing. The prize is, uh, was called the Tricorder Prize, Qualcomm Tricorder Prize, and it falls within our health and life sciences vertical. And the, the Tricorder 
the original tricorder came out of Star Trek. You guys remember the series Star Trek, right? So in Star Trek, so we, we're a futurist organization, so we, we look at science fiction as, as guidance and sometimes, sometimes. And so the tricorder was what the doctor on the Enterprise used to scan people when they came back from you know, their excursion off the ship to say, oh, you've got Rigerian fever, or he's an alien, he needs to be put out of the airlock, or whatever it might be. So we said, why can't we reinvent the tricorder for medical use today? So we put out a competition, a call for innovators everywhere. It was a $10 million prize sponsored by Qualcomm. And here were the rules. You have to build a device that fits in the palm of your hand and non-invasively can diagnose 18 different health conditions and we stated what the health conditions were. So there were health conditions like cardiac arrest, stroke, um, high blood pressure, blood, uh, urine analysis, etc. And then pneumonia, typhoid, malaria, etc. So there were 18 health conditions. We had teams, over 300 teams from all over the world. We tested the last six teams in an ER, emergency room in San Diego Hospital for six months of rigorous testing. A quick side note, very proud to say that team number three from Chennai was one of the six finalists. So now uh, team number three I mean, we had teams from all over the world. So the Swiss team, the German team that made it into the finals, their tricorder was amazing and, uh, you know, cost a couple thousand dollars and would be used in very high-end ERs for triage. So as soon as you come in, you know what the problem is with the patient. However, Team Dunman 3, their tricorder, also about this size, every single surface is a sensor, Right now, they're still in prototype stage, and their price point is about $100 to $120, and they're hoping for it to plummet to about $30, $35. Imagine what that will do to transform rural health. I mean, it's quite amazing. So we believe you can innovate globally, but people who are applying for our prizes based on what their local market and their local context is and the impact they want to have, they will do both. They will be innovating on a global scale and yet taking into consideration the local markets. Would you like me to answer that question by Anusha? Yeah. When Anusha was asked yeah, why not? Space? I'm going to give you a minute. Okay, sure. Okay. sure. Sorry, I talked a lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's a pretty, pretty provocative question and a very, very valid question. Yeah? And um, so space is an amazingly hostile place. We humans are, are really out of our element, way out of our element when we go to space. However, in order to survive in space, a lot of science and technology needs to be developed. You don't know this, and if I was a little more prepared, I, I mean, I can, I can look it up because I don't remember the numbers, but there are, not in the hundreds, but in the thousands of innovations, that we use every day, I think like a Ziploc bag is even one of them, you know, that were originated in space by the NASA program or by the Russian program or somebody. And now these innovations are part of our everyday life. Also, there's a lot of science and research for health and for other sectors that need to happen in zero gravity environments. As a human race, that our next evolution is not going to be Earthbound. We are going to voyage beyond our planet. And opening up the moon for exploration, four minerals that we cannot mine on Earth, asteroids passing by that, have, that are made out of very valuable materials that could save lives on Earth, those kind of things are necessary. And so an investment in that sector is also very, very necessary. And I will say that some of our biggest and oldest fans and supporters are the people from Israel. The Indian Space Organization has been amazing, and they've been amazing friends to us for many, many years. We've tested technologies there. You know, we, we have a very good relationship with some of the former chairmen, especially.
course, with just realizing the importance of its addiction, and we've overcome a lot of barriers there. Do you see any of that influencing the work that you have? Do you feel yourself very like local, and you have to solve it here? What are your relationships with sort of the innovate globally, execute locally? It's uh, very complex and very difficult compared to the rest of the world. So for the rest of the world, the problem is largely smoking and it's largely smoking cigarette. For us, we have so many varieties of tobacco. If you go to any any village in India and you ask them, do they take tobacco? They will say no to you because they don't take tobacco, they take beauty. They don't take tobacco, they use machete. Or they don't take tobacco, they use good cover. Good is not tobacco. Actually, it is, but they don't know the good So the list goes on and on. There might be 50, 60, 70 such products. Some even not even known to people like us who have been working in the rabbit group for, for 20 years. Who act, that actually exist in Australia. But I want to actually give a specific example about you know the issues about global versus local. When we first started working on a school-based program, uh, we had approached um, and that had, there was no funding in India. There was zero funding in India and zero interest in India in tobacco control. So we had uh, approached the American Cancer Society and this is disease control and NCI and we said we really want to do a school-based program in India. And the first response they gave to me after about listening to me for 30 seconds was School-based programs don't work, they fail everywhere. And that was it. it. The conversation ended there. But we knew we had to do it because for India, with a country of over 400 million kids, with the risk that so many of them are going to end up as tobacco addicts, you know, we already have staggering numbers. We have probably the highest number of children tobacco addicts in the world. And if that is the situation, and if we expect 30% of our kids to be addicted to tobacco, we have to keep look at this as a school-based problem. So the question, I'm, I'm just putting the question on its head to say, sometimes it's not about global versus local. Sometimes the local conditions are such that you have to innovate locally for local issues. And you have to find that solution. So today we have a scalable school-based program which has proved itself to have you know, um, tremendous tobacco uh, uh, use rates, I mean, very low tobacco use rates, one third of national average. That's not something which happens if you don't take that chance and you don't you know, have the courage to go and do it your own way. Which is what happens in most contexts, not only this, but in all development issues in India. The other thing I wanted to say is that in India, there is an opportunity to create uh, a lot of uh, like laboratories of, of trying new things and then scaling them and doing it at a low cost. So for me, it's an, it's an opportunity to say, why can't we do it? If anyone can do it, we can do it. We can do it. And you can hear all these examples, right, which say the same thing. It's, doing it at low cost, doing it scalable. So that is what I wanted to say. And coming to the question you just asked me about the global issues in tobacco versus India, you know, there are some places where we, we are really far behind on the battle, like package warnings, because, you know, we still are arguing with our, you know, it's, we are the, one of the few countries in the world where when we have a discussion of package warnings in the health ministry, the people attending that are largely tobacco companies, which are food cars, cigarette, dairy companies, talking about their problems of packaging. We are not having health advocates around the table taking those decisions. So the irony is we've got a huge pushback on things like that. But we have been ahead in terms of the fact that we have scaled on school-based tobacco programs more than any other country has. We started doing a lot more work on television, on in the movies. I mean, a lot of people have received that issue very negatively. I know we all go to a movie and we see that terrible the ad which comes in the middle. People tell me, oh, the mood kharab ho jata hai, ad dekhe. But the fact is, our country had the courage to do some of those things which other countries have not had. I think this is a win some, lose some, but the battle is too large for us. Our wins are too small compared to where we really need to be on this issue. I mean, a big part of your portfolio is actually in, in India. I'm assuming with that there is innovation here and that you can really achieve, achieve scale. I don't know if that's the same here, but um, now, but will you share a bit about your perspective and then we'll open it up for questions. Portfolio is in India. It's very large, but it's also fair to say that I actually, I have sort of, you know, answer that uh, the question and the fact that I think that we're talking so much about it means that I think that that job is, you know, it's done its job. We've all talked about it since morning. But I would say that two parts. One is that in order to be able to execute, you have to innovate. So I think when you say execute locally and innovate globally, execute doesn't preclude innovation. Um, so I think that's the first point I just want to raise. I think somehow we imply that execute is sort of very simple, just go out and do it and all the real thinking stuff happens when you innovate. I mean, anybody who's, you know, in real life will tell you that, you know, what, what works in a lab never works in real life, right? So I think that's the first part of it. Second part is that I think if you take globally, not 
sort of little metaphorically and not purely as a, you know, India versus outside of India or, or regional. Um, actually, I think the, the important question really is that um, are there ways in which you can, you know, uh, use local learnings as well as things that are happening even at a national level? Because frankly, what happens in Nagaland and what happens in, you know, Kashmir or Kerala, I mean, it might as well be another country uh, in terms of the kind of cultural differences. So, so I actually think that what I've seen in, in our portfolio is twofold. One is that I'm actually very uh, pleased to say that right from the beginning, in the space of social enterprises, India has been seen as the forerunner. So everywhere around the world, um, you, I mean, whenever I look, I mean, I sit on many of the uh, sort of leadership team uh, calls of other deals we do around the country, around the world, and they will always ask me, so what happened in India when you guys tried this? So I think there's definitely a sense that, so this philosophy, think about it, as a really as a network and not so much as global local, I think there's a tremendous amount of learning you can get. Um, I think the second part is that uh, when you uh, when you take that uh, you know when you, when you think about where India is in, in this whole space, I think that we've at least 20 different countries ourselves, and I think that uh, for example what we are learning today in healthcare in primary healthcare in Kerala is hugely valuable. Uh, in other parts of, of India. And I think that's where I think this conversation is a very good one to see how are we actually using our own best practices and scale, you know, so that it actually can scale as well as spread. I like that discussion in the morning where we talked about where we talked about both scaling and spreading of information. I think they are two different things. So um, yeah, and I think that that's, and that's something which uh, from my perspective I find that, um, you know, uh, really, really uh, simple answer on, for example, the I want to end with the example I gave you on D-Light. D-Light's idea may have come from Stanford, but India was really where it got, you know, it got sort of uh, truly tested. So I think India owns ownership, has real moral authority for all the innovation that happened, uh, and not Stanford. Look at this innovative idea of home-based neonatal care, HBNC. HBNC method is something which he uh, and his team came up with. Uh, thoroughly vetted by all the authorities, published in the Lancet magazine, something which is used all over India. It's used outside of India globally also. Uh, so that's some, that's one of the, that's something which we use in our Mansi program. And just to look at the opposite uh, example or the reverse example, look at Khan Academy. Okay, that's a, that was an innovation from Silicon Valley, right? And can you use that uh, locally for our education purposes? Absolutely. So should we get into a formula or should we just keep our minds open? I think we should keep our minds open. We, we recently uh, used something called flipped classroom, which is what we, uh, we use that in about 400 of our 1,100 digital equalizer program, where the classrooms are in, just think of, think of a government classroom, right? Where the poorest of the kids go. They're given tablets. They're given tablets with content of the 6th grade, 7th grade, 8th grade, which they have to see in very interesting uh, video format for one hour today. And the class actually happens the next day. So just imagine what happens in the classroom the next day. The teacher is not anymore teaching, like I was taught to, but the teacher is just a, a moderator. The teacher is asking questions. The discussion that happens in the classroom, it will make you think that's like the Harvard Business Class going, and it's a case study discussion going. So, that's a beautiful innovation which we are implementing in a lot of schools here. A particular individual on the panel, and then I'll move to sort of closing remarks. So let me take one or two more questions. I run a non-profit called Cherish, and our main work is in three, along three dimensions in rural Karnataka, which is the educate, prepare, and secure. Uh, educating, meaning the first, the early learning for the girl child, and then uh, tying it to skills for livelihoods, that's to prepare the young woman, and then the secure, which is uh, making sure she has a livelihood. So looking at a very systemic uh, pattern in what we do. I'm interested uh, to ask you, Ravi, uh, your, uh, the, the entire discussion seems to be around scale, and what are the real answers under the numbers, so to speak. So. Uh, your model obviously seems to be fantastic from the point of view of scale and what you have achieved. I mean, your numbers are pretty staggering, 23 out of 29. So if we can actually bridge this gap that, you know, early nonprofits like ourselves, we are just about 
uh, two years old in terms of operation. So we bridge it and reach like what you're reaching. Can you give us some um, ways of, just tell us a little bit about your model, I guess, that's it. The development field for a long time, they have lots, they are in the ecosystem. They actually see what the issues are. Mm -hmm. And they have lots of innovative ideas. We pick a few of them and we test them. Um, so ours is uh, simply based on that. I can actually spend a lot of time with you offline if you uh, if you want. Because we would like to think of AI as a platform which belongs to all of you. Uh, you know, come and ask us questions. We'll tell you what we did, what mis mis mistakes we made, and what things were successful for us. At the end of the day, to scale, you need a lot of people to join the journey. I mean, we have this issue, uh, and this is something we uh, we preach from the top of the mountain hill. You know, when we have a first one crore a rupee or two crores a rupee, we want to put our father's name, mother's name, and we want to start something on our own, right? This uh, individual philanthropy versus collective philanthropy is something that we need to seriously think about. If uh, you are doing it because you want to satisfy your ego, go ahead and do that, right? If you are doing it simply because you actually are compassionate about touching the lives of the people, then I would suggest we should look at good examples, join hands. Uh, joining hands makes us go farther, reach a lot more people. That one crore which should have touched 1,000 people would touch 5,000 people. You know, so we, we we constantly ensure what we do, the government comes in and takes over. That's where the scaling happens. Awesome. Just to be clear, I, uh, I wanted to just ask, actually I wanted to just ask Abhishek, because he was very uh, uh, <coughs> self-deprecatory starting off the comments, and he was the youngest person here. It struck me that, um, on the panel at least, and uh, it struck me that we have this panel about enabling uh, actors who lead, that will lead to change in India. And I'm wondering, as a new entrant, uh, uh, how would we enable enablers? What are the potential and possibilities for organizations like yours uh, to scale in India? What's needed in the ecosystem of enablers? That's one of our questions one notch above from uh, the actual class. In, in our classroom, we call it OHV. It's like overhead transmission. <laughs> uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, one thing which, which is important is, uh, you know, when we got into the sector, it was, you know, uh, for us it was a big market and a big need and we thought if we, you know, can do something uh, from, you know, uh, solving a problem, we can make a large company and that was the only thing. Uh, in terms of change, in terms of impact, I think that's the secondary piece for, for us. It was. You know, it's the same as you know any other company seeing any other problem and trying to make a solution and make a large company out of it. And I think till the time you know the numbers work, the you know the targets are hit, all the things work well. Uh, but I think uh, you know what we have seen is a lot of people get confused as to what their real aim is. Either is it uh, social or enterprise. Uh, and if you are in that confusion, I think. On both sides, you don't uh, do well. I mean, either you know be great at the social aspect and you know do work there, or be great at the enterprise aspect. I think if you try and tick mark a lot of boxes, I think you know you end up with nothing. Uh, and so for us, when we started, it was purely saying that there is a problem, uh, we can solve it, and we can make a large company out of it. And what we are seeing is once we get to scale and get, and that will happen only if we are solving a problem. And you know if we are just Trying to do something for the sake of it, it won't happen. Extremely important question. Um, I think by definition, everything that in this space um, tends to be subscale, um, and I think that uh, even as you know, what we consider as scale as, at an individual level is still sub subscale when you consider the enormity of the problem. You know, Zina talked about the number of people who are uh, you know uh, who, are, uh, uh, who have no food and you know, huge problems, right? And I think that's where. There is a huge role for enabling ecosystem builders to be able to come in and actually be able to pull the best out of what's happening. Um, and I'm, I'm directing that specifically to get to someone like you because I think that's the role that uh, you know people like yourselves and there are many other people who can play because by definition that's the ability to be able to look at what's happening and say you know this works this is applicable across the board is something that. Uh, you know, finding ways to, uh, creative ways to collaborate in a manner by which large corporations, uh, small corporations, um, you know, NGOs actually find ways to come and work together. It's, it's well possible. What happens is each of us are so, 
even though we can classify ourselves as enablers, we're still subscale enablers. I mean, we we have five, we have ten people in our team doing each of us running and doing individual investments, and it tends to be subscale. So I think um, you know, I think that that's I think a very important question. I, I'm not sure if the answer is, is is that easy, but I think if we want to make a systemic change, we want to move the needle in a meaningful way. I think that people will have to come on, and, and they will have to be people who play the role of convening. And those people can either be people who have a huge amount of money, like the Gates Foundation, who says, "I'll just solve malaria," or people who bring the knowledge. And I think, I think I'm sort of trying to answer the question in that way. Stay back for a few minutes. If people want to reach out to some of the panelists, we'll uh, all be here. We want to be respectful of your time as well as the agenda. So thank you very much uh, for this great session. Thank you.